Good evening, everyone. And a very warm welcome to this service of worship this evening. It's lovely to see you. Uh, thank you for joining with us. And if you're visiting with us this evening, we warmly welcome you uh, to Greenwell Street in the name of our Lord Jesus and trust that we will be richly blessed and encouraged as we worship together this evening. Just before we commence the service, I just want to bring you a few congregational announcements. Uh, this is Communion Sunday. We celebrated Communion this morning, and at the end of the, the service this evening, there will also be a, a short time of Communion for those who were unable to join with us this morning. And so after uh, this service is completed, uh, there will be a short service of Communion. And if you would like to participate in that, please come to the front of the church and the Reverend Macaulay will preside over that. So that's at the end of this service. Just a reminder that the service next Lord's Day, next Sunday morning is at 11.30 instead of 11. It's 11.30 due to Remembrance Sunday. Um, another announcement here regarding the choir rehearsals for the carol service, the carol service on the 18th of December. Uh, the choir rehearsals start next Sunday evening after the evening service. So that's uh, next Sunday evening after, at the end of the evening service, uh, choir rehearsal. So uh, do share that information with maybe those who are not here this evening and just bear that in mind for the next Sunday night, those choir rehearsals. And I know that we greatly appreciated the ministry of the choir uh, during our harvest season as well. Just another notice here regarding Advent readings by J.C. Ryle, that great uh, theologian from a different generation, J.C. Ryle Advent readings. There's a little sign-up sheet at the back of the church if you'd like a copy of, of those Advent readings. Uh, just put your name uh, on that uh, sheet if you would like to uh, a copy of that, and uh, that would be greatly appreciated. And I think that is all the announcements for this evening. As we come before God, our call to worship this evening is taken from Psalm 116 on this uh, Communion Sunday where the psalmist writes, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. And so we're going to stand now as we sing our opening praise, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. <laughs>
turn now to our responsive reading through the book of Psalms, and we are up to Psalm 76 this evening. Hopefully it should come up on the screen, and as is our custom, I'll read the first verse and invite you to respond in the second verse and following. This is the Word of God. In Judah God is known, His name is great in Israel. His tent is in Salem, His dwelling place in Zion. There He broke the flashing arrows, the shields and the swords, the weapons of war. You are resplendent with light, more majestic than the mountains which we came. Valiant men lie plundered, they sleep in their last sleep, not one of the warriors can lift his hands. At your rebuke, O God, my horse and chariot lie still. You alone are to be feared. Who can stand before you when you are angry? In heaven you pronounce judgment, and the land here is quiet. When you, O God, rose up to judge, to save all the afflicted of the land, surely your wrath against men and your praise, and the survivors of your wrath are restrained. Make vows to the Lord your God and fulfill them. Let all the neighboring lands bring gifts to the one to be feared. He breaks the spirit of the rulers. He is feared of the kings of the earth. Amen, and we thank God for this reading from the book of Psalms. We come before God now with our prayers of adoration and confession. Let us pray together. Our eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you, the one true and living God, who is to be worshipped and adored in every place and every time, world without end. You are the God who is holy and pure and dwell in light that is unapproachable. You are the God who made the world and all that it contains. You are the one who made humankind after your own image and crowned them with honor and glory. Father, we echo the words of the psalmist when he reminds us, it is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing psalms to your name, O Most High, to declare your love in the morning and your faithfulness every night. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to towards us, your children, over this past week and even throughout this day. We bless you for your mercies, which are renewed every morning, and for your steadfast love, which endures forever. We thank you for our salvation, won at the cross and purchased with the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for your saving grace that keeps us in this life and brings us safely to the next. Father God, we come before you, the God who is so different from us, and yet the God who knows us intimately because you are our creator, and so, Father, we confess our sinfulness. We confess that we have sinned in thought, in word, and in deed, through negligence, through weakness, and through our own deliberate fault. We confess, O God, that we are incredibly weak-willed people, and we are far too easily lured by the world, the flesh, and the devil. Lord, we remember the words of the Apostle John, who said, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, in the silence of our own hearts, we now name those sins before you, trusting in the forgiveness that comes to us through Christ. Father, we thank you that you take away the bad things in our lives. You take away the sin that spoils and ruins, and you replace it with your spirit, which produces fruit in keeping with repentance. We rejoice, Lord, on this communion Sunday, that we come as invited guests, and we drink of the cup of salvation. Nourish us, we pray, with your word, and these holy sacraments as ordained and blessed by our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And together as God's people, we pray as our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen amen we continue in our attitude of worship as we sing our next hymn this evening a lovely contemporary hymn behold our god Our Old Testament reading this evening is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and you'll find that on page 185 of the Pew Bible, 185. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, this is God's Word. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land you are crossing to the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your forefathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. 
Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massa. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that it may go well with you and you may go in and take over the good land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers, thrusting out all your enemies before you, as the Lord said. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible, upon Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land that he promised on oath to our forefathers. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God, so that we may always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all his law, before the Lord our God, as he commanded us, that will be our righteousness. Amen. And we thank God for this reading from his holy word. We turn now to our prayers of intercession as we take some time to pray for other people in our congregation and in the world. And this evening, we're going to remember those uh, of our congregation who are unwell at this time. I also want to pray for the, the cost of living crisis, which seems to be spiraling out of control and nobody seems to know what's happening. And also to pray for the, the local government situation in Northern Ireland, which is not functioning at this time. And so we turn to our loving Heavenly Father as we pray together. Father, it was, the, it was James, the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, who reminds us about enduring various and many trials. Lord, we confess tonight that we are very needy people. We look to you, our God and Father, as children look to their parents for help and guidance, for love and salvation. Father, we pray for those members of our church who are going through many and various trials. We pray for those who are in hospital, for those who are undergoing further treatment at various places. And we pray for those who are convalescing at home following time in hospital. Lord God, we realize that at our lowest point, human words of comfort can only take us so far, and so we turn to your living word, the Bible, for help and instruction. And as St. James reminds us, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. We pray for those in our church and in our communities who are fearful of this coming winter and the alarming rise in the cost of food and fuel. Father, we thank you that you open your hand and you satisfy every living thing. We pray for the work, the work of food banks across our province who are proving to be a real lifeline in the midst of difficult days. We pray for social workers, community workers, and volunteers who are helping so many people in the face of impossible decisions. We remember our emergency services, firefighters, police officers, paramedics, who serve our community 24-7 and who often place themselves in harm's way for the good of others. 
We pray for children and young people as they return to school tomorrow following the half-term break and ask that they would know peace, safety, and the stability in our school environments. Father, we pray too for our devolved government at Stormont, which has collapsed, and we now face the prospect of a January election once again. Lord, we ask for your wisdom in this difficult situation. We pray that you would allow for common ground to be found, for negotiations to be redoubled, and for an earnest effort on all parts to restore a legislative government here in Northern Ireland. And so, our Father, to that end, keep us ever thankful for all of your mercies to this nation. Lord, in a sea of aggressive secularism and humanism, may each one of us shine as true lights for our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose precious and life-giving name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue to worship God as we sing our next praise this evening. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. This evening we are continuing our little series in the book of Ephesians, and so can I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. You'll find that on page 1177 of the Pew Bible, 1177. Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 9. This is God's word. 
Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exacerbate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever he does, whether he is slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Amen. And we thank God for this reading from his word. If you want to keep your Bible open at Ephesians chapter 6 as we work our way through this passage this evening, and as we do so, let us pray together and ask for God's help. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So this evening we are continuing our, our series through the book of Ephesians, and uh, we know that this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. And chapter 6 is the final chapter of this letter, and so you'll be glad to hear that the end is in sight as we move into chapter 6. Last Sunday morning together we considered the theme of God's will for the family, God's will for the family. And so tonight we're going to look at the second part of that theme where Paul, as we've just read together, addresses children and fathers, slaves and masters. Paul's teaching, as we're going to see, is wonderfully practical and relevant, even just within these nine verses that we read together. And so the first little sub-point that I want to make this evening is this. It's fairly obvious. Children are to obey their parents. Children are to obey their parents. Verses 1 to 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that you may enjoy long life on the earth. They say that you only get one go at childhood, and indeed you only get one go at raising children. And our childhood years are so formative that they often, uh, how we are raised often determines how we spend the rest of our lives, how our adult lives turn out. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Christian church at Ephesus in the first century, and he somewhat surprisingly now turns his attention to children. And in this context and in this culture, this is very unusual for children and young people not only to be addressed, but to be acknowledged in a letter like this. And in writing to children, we can assume two things. First of all, we can assume that there were children in this church because they're, they're addressed here. And secondly, we can assume that they were of an age to understand what Paul was saying to them. And you know, folks, for many children across the world, they do not enjoy a good or a healthy or a proper upbringing. And we hear cases of abuse and neglect almost daily, don't we? Often committed in the home behind closed doors and also in various other settings across society. But notice carefully what Paul is saying here in chapter 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That little phrase there, in the Lord, is important. It is God's will for children to obey their parents for a number of important reasons. Practically and fundamentally, it is for a child's own benefit and welfare, isn't it, that they obey their parents because a child is young and often foolish and without experience the experience of life that an adult has. Our parents and our guardians, if we look back, are wells of wisdom for us, aren't they? And experience and knowledge. And their instruction, of course, is given for our own good. And your instruction to your children is given for their good. Even though children so often cannot see it. The terrible teens when children develop into adolescence are often very challenging years in many households. 
trying to explain to a teenager that four, four hours on the Xbox is not good for their eyesight, never mind their physical or mental health, or trying to explain to children that a third helping of jelly and ice cream will only give them a very sore stomach and often lead to a tantrum, can't it? But you know, within the Jewish household, parents and grandparents were held in very high esteem and very high honor. And 2,000 years ago, in this context, children would have been seen but not heard. But I wonder, is that what Paul is really saying in this letter? And Well, I don't believe so, because Paul is addressing children directly here that we've just read this evening. And first of all, it accords with natural law, with natural law, because almost every society across the world, whether they are Christian or not, teaches that children are to obey their parents, that they are to respect those that are older than them. And that is what the Bible teaches also. The natural law shows us that it is right that we obey our parents for our own nourishment and our own well-being. But you know, we need to be realistic about this society that we live in because we know that in reality, if we were being really honest, very few children completely obey their parents. We hear often of broken relationships where a child falls out with their parents and they grow up and they move away and then they become estranged. And then sadly that wound has never healed and over time they, they become estranged permanently and even estranged children don't attend their parents' funerals. And you know, disobedience to parents is one of the hallmarks of a fallen world. Paul writes in the book of Romans in chapter one, these scathing words. He says, furthermore, as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. Now, those are strong and very powerful words from the Apostle Paul. But did you notice that it was in there? They disobey their parents. Disobedience towards parents is an act of defiance against authority. And it is an act of defiance towards our Creator God. Paul mentions the disobedience of parents in another one of his little letters in 2 Timothy 3, and he describes them as days of difficulty. Secondly, not only does it show us the natural law that children are to obey their parents, but it also points us to the divine law, the divine law that is imprinted upon every human heart. Look at verse 2 of our passage. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on the earth. Do you see what Paul does here? He quotes the fifth commandment from Deuteronomy 5 and 16. Paul the apostle, as we know, was a Pharisee of the Pharisees and he was deeply steeped in Jewish law. And he looks back, he looks back to the law. He looks back to the basic building blocks and the foundation of God's dealing with humankind, the Ten Commandments. It is God's will that children obey their parents, and it even comes with a promise so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. The Duke of Windsor, you may recall, was King Edward VIII who abdicated the throne in December 1936, that was the late queen's uncle. And uh, the, the King Edward VIII, you may recall, abdicated because of his relationship with Wallace Simpson, uh, and she was an American. And the Duke of Windsor is reported to have been amazed at all of the technological advancements that had been made in America. And he is reported to have said this, everything in the American home is controlled by switches 
except the children. And the Duke of Windsor was also once asked, what impressed you the most about America? And he said this, the way American parents obey their children. But you know, the book of Proverbs in the Bible has a great deal to say about rearing children because the book of Proverbs is wisdom literature. Listen to these words from Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. You see, there is a promise attached to this commandment that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. When a child or a young person is instructed in the things of God and of life by following a clear and godly example of their parents in the home, they are more likely to lead a godly life themselves. Children are like little sponges, aren't they? They absorb everything that they see and everything that they hear. Children are to obey their parents because it is God's will, and parents are to lead by example. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself obeyed his earthly parents, Mary and Joseph. We read this in the gospel according to Luke. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. I wonder this evening if you're here and you have children or grandchildren, let me ask you, who governs your child's upbringing? Who governs your child's upbringing? Does the state govern your child's upbringing? Does the school govern your child's upbringing? Does social media, does their peers and their friends, or does the ever-changing winds of culture? Well, of course, the answer to all of those is no, absolutely no, because you and you alone govern your child's upbringing. And perhaps you're here this evening and you don't have any children or grandchildren. Perhaps maybe you've got nieces or nephews or cousins, or maybe even your neighbor's friends will allow your love for the Lord Jesus to shine through you into their young lives. Lead by example and share the good news of Jesus. You know, this verse, folks, has very wide-ranging implications, doesn't it? Because we don't sometimes always realize or know how our lives and our example and our words can impact other young lives that we come in contact with. The church that I grew up in in Sainfield used to have a There used to be a Friday night youth club and uh, for for the teenagers in the town. And back in the day, in the early 2000s, I think it was, it used to attract up to two to 300 young people from the district. And many of those young people attending were not Christians. They had never heard or they knew little or nothing about the Christian faith or about Jesus. And at this youth club, there was fun and games. And then at nine o'clock, there was always an epilogue, a talk from the Bible. And you know, some of those young people came from very disturbed and very troubled homes, but lives were touched through that youth club over those years. Lives were touched and indeed changed by the Lord Jesus Christ as a result of the ministry of that youth club. Even if the talk only lasted 10 minutes, the example of the leaders, the encouragement from the leaders, and even just a listening ear changed the course of some of their lives. And I know some of those young people personally who are now adults. You know, God is working. God is working in all sorts of ways that we have no idea about. The great evangelist D.L. Moody was once asked, how many converts did you get last night? And he answered two and one half. And And the man said, do you mean two adults and one child? And he replied, no, two children and one adult. A child converted is an entire life converted. Yes, the Lord is working in all sorts of ways that we know nothing about. The second little sub point that I want to make is this. Parents are to lead by example. Look at verse four of this passage. Do not, uh, fathers, do not exacerbate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. 
The authorized version translates verse 4 like this. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's very interesting if you're using the updated version of the NIV that the translators have added a little footnote there beside the word father. And they've given an alternative reading of parents. And so we're, as the reader, we're, we're left asking ourselves, does Paul mean fathers or does he mean parents? Well, we need to remember the context into which the Apostle Paul is writing here. Because remember in our previous study last week, Paul told the church that the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church. And it's into this Greco-Roman culture that Paul is writing in which fathers would have had absolute control and authority in the household. But the fifth commandment tells us to honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you. And so clearly Paul is referring here to both fathers and mothers, parents, when he writes in verse 4. Of course, the literal reading from the Greek is the word for fathers, but he's referring to both here. But what does Paul mean when he says, do not exacerbate your children? The English Standard Version translates it like this, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. As I mentioned earlier, not everyone enjoys a good relationship with their child or their children. And unfortunately, some parents fail spectacularly because they set an awful example for their children. We only get one go at childhood. It isn't a dress rehearsal, and nor can we have another go at it. Because children grow up very quickly, don't they? And their childhood often determines what kind of adult they will become. But here's God's wisdom for every struggling parent this evening. First of all, don't be unreasonable with your children. Don't exacerbate them, as Paul says, if they're struggling. Don't ask your children to do something that you yourself are not prepared to do. Because remember, children and young people have very limited capabilities as they grow and develop. Very often people load children down with impossible demands that only leads to frustration and anger whenever they're not able to fulfill those demands. There's also fault-finding parents out there, those who, are, those who continually find room for improvement wherever they look. I think I mentioned before one Sunday that I'm a fan of, uh, of Downton Abbey, that successful series of the late 19th and early 20th century of the, the Crawley family and uh, aristocratic family that lived at Downton Abbey and the lives of their servants that live in the servants' quarters underneath. But, you know, one of the best examples that I can think of this is illustrated in the relationship between Lady Rose and her mother, Susan Leclerc, who are cousins of the Crawley family. Now, if you're a fan of Downton Abbey here this evening, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you're not, my apologies, you'll not have a clue what I'm talking about. But the relationship between Lady Rose and her mother was so toxic that she had to move away from her mother and she moved in with the Crawley family, which is how she came into the series. But in one memorable episode, Susan, her mother, is criticizing her daughter for not standing straight enough in the ballroom, to which Lady Rose bursts out with those words, can I not even have five minutes without being criticized? It's very easy, of course, that we can be unreasonable with our children and expect perfection because we know perfection is beyond all of us. But God's wisdom for parents is that we bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The great reformer John Calvin wrote in his commentary in Ephesians, in those three little words, bring them up. He says this, let them be kindly cherished. Let them be kindly cherished. Cherish them because they won't be children for very long. Bring them up in the discipline and in the instruction of the Lord, says the Apostle Paul. Discipline, although painful at the time, is often necessary. A child that is not disciplined will never learn right from wrong or good from evil. Proverbs 15 and 32 says, whoever ignores instruction 
despises himself, but whoever listens to reproof gains intelligence. Hebrews 12 and 11 says, for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness by those who have been trained by it. Secondly, that little word instruction there that Paul uses, it literally means to place before the mind, to place before the mind the best help for training and instruction in the things of God is the Bible. I am absolutely convinced that the Bible is all sufficient. Paul wrote two letters to a young pastor called Timothy. And in 2 Timothy 3, he says this, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, folks, the home and family life are where children and young people should first hear about our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. The the home and family life are where children and young people should first hear about our Lord Jesus Christ. Too often in the past, parents have sent their children to Sunday school and they have sent their children to church with grandparents or neighbors or friends. Now, I'm not saying for one second that there's anything wrong with that. It's, it's a very good thing to do. But too often in the past, parents have sent their children when they've never attended themselves. Or the children have been sent to church with grandparents or friends and the onus for the catechizing of, catechization of children has been placed upon leaders and helpers in the church. But of course, Paul says quite plainly here in Ephesians 6 that the responsibility begins in the home and begins with the child's parents. From our Old Testament reading this evening, we read from Deuteronomy chapter 6, where the Word of God says, These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down, and when you get up. Yes, catechizing children in the ways of God begins at home. Impress them daily into their minds about the love and grace of God that has been shown so wonderfully in our Lord Jesus. I want to just close this evening with the final little sub-point very briefly, servants and masters. And as you can see here, Paul covers a lot in this passage, as he generally does in the book of Ephesians servants and masters. The topic of slavery is a very sensitive one, which has really come to the fore over the past few years. We have witnessed on our TV screens large groups of protesters vandalizing statues and physically pulling down statues of former slave drivers. On the 7th of June 2020, a group of anti-racism protesters in Bristol toppled the statue of Edward Colston, a 17th century slave driver who is believed to have trafficked 80,000 men, women, and children from the continent of Africa to America. You may recall back in 2020, a wave of anti-racism protesters, uh, protests across the UK following the killing of George Floyd in the United States of America. But slavery is a very sensitive topic, and I don't want to really go into this in in any great detail this evening other than to say this. Firstly, we must remember the context and the culture into which the Apostle Paul wrote this letter. Folks, he didn't write it last week. He wrote it 2,000 years ago. The society and the culture was so very different from ours that we cannot even begin to imagine it. Commentators estimate that there were about 60 million slaves throughout the Roman Empire. Now that is a huge number of people. 
And masters and slaves, which are words that Paul uses, are not words that we would necessarily use today, nor are they words that people would be very comfortable to use. But because society in Paul's day had so many slaves, some of them had become Christians, including some of the masters had become Christians in Paul's day. And so Paul very wonderfully addresses the topic head on in this letter about how they should conduct themselves in the household of God. The letter that the apostle Paul wrote to Philemon in the New Testament involved a slave called Onesimus. Onesimus was one of Philemon's slaves and he had run away and he had met the apostle Paul and he had become a Christian wonderfully. And then Paul writes to Philemon to say that he is sending Onesimus back to him and to forgive him and to reinstate him for running away. Very unusual in this context and in the culture of Paul's day. But nevertheless, slavery was very much part and parcel of the culture in Ephesus. And as I mentioned, there are some of the church converts, such as Philemon, had a slave in their household. But you know, folks, by the time Paul was writing this letter, sweeping changes had taken place in society in terms of the treatment of slaves, of servants. Because slaves were very often part of the family and very often they worked hand in hand with the head of the household. And slaves could eventually earn this title freedman. In other words, their term as a slave was done. And many did. Many did before even the age of 30. But Paul says that slaves are to be people of sincerity. Look at verse 6 of this passage. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God in your heart. In the book of Colossians, which is almost uh, a parallel to this letter in Colossians 3, Paul says these words, whatever you do, whoever you are, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that it is from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ you know, the Apostle Paul in these few verses neither condemns nor condones slavery, but he gives some very practical advice for slaves and for masters. Masters are to sl treat their slaves and servants with respect because they know that they have a master in heaven, the Lord God, with whom there is no favoritism. I want to close this evening just by saying this. Very often preachers make the comparison when they're preaching this text and the illustration of an, an employer and an employee. Well, I have to say, whenever you go to work tomorrow morning, if you're still employed, I certainly hope you don't feel like a slave or are treated like a slave. But practically speaking, of course, Christian employees are to be exemplary in their conduct, both to their employer and to their colleagues. We believe and trust in a God who is perfect and who never makes mistakes and who determines all our days before one of them comes to be. And you are, folks, right now where God wants you to be in terms of your employment and your life generally. If you are still employed, Paul says to work heartily as though you were serving the Lord and not simply men. One commentator writes tongue in cheek, Work as though Jesus were your supervisor, even if that's in secular employment. Do you know, we are all equal before the true and living God. Paul says at the end of this little section, reminding the church that there is no favoritism with God. And whilst social structures and standing were very evident in Paul's day between slaves and masters and so forth, and even in our day to a certain extent, the Christian faith brings us all to the same level. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and repentance towards God because everything else is of little importance in the light of eternity. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for your word to us this evening. We thank you for this immense letter that Paul wrote to this church which has so much to teach us even today in 2022. 
Lord, we thank you for children and young people with which you bless us with. And we pray, Lord, that our example to them would be one of a godly example. And Lord, we pray for all of us as we go into this brand new week that we would recall these words of your servant Paul and put them into practice for our own good and for your glory. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to bring our service to a conclusion this evening as we sing our final praise, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. The service is ended. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now this night and forevermore. Amen. Amen.